Coach Kyle did a great job right there. I did step out to see what this jacket looked like without a shirt on. And it was, it was not as good as I had hoped. Uh, yesterday we had a remarkable day over at Hub Headquarters. We spent the morning uh, with the executive team and then some in the afternoon that were nominated by some of the allying offices uh, attended a, about a four hour session that we did. It was, it was uh, meaningful, I hope it was got some good feedback, fruitful, and, and hopefully there's one or two, perhaps even as many as six things that they can take back and put in play to make us more efficient. I had the privilege of serving in our Army for 25 years, but my, my roots are in the great state. I've still got a radio show in Austin that comes on each Saturday morning, and I start the radio show uh, out each morning by saying there are a lot of states that are great, but there's only one great state. So I'm a fourth generation native Texan, born in San Antonio, uh, went to TCU, uh, played baseball for the Horned Frogs, in fact, uh, in fact, David Rasco and I we were in the same dorm. We knew each other when we were both athletes at TCU. Before that, though, I went to uh, Ranger Junior College. And I'll pause because someone in here likely knows where Ranger is. Cisco is a step up from Ranger. Uh, there was a sign at Ranger Junior College that I, I love to share with audiences. And the sign said this on the weight room. It said, welcome to Ranger Junior College. We really want you to be happy here. It's a nice start. And if there's something that you want that we haven't got, we'll show you how to get along without it. <laughs> the 25 years that I did have the privilege of serving in, in our Army is, was, was remarkable. It was very unique. Uh, the last 10 years were at the birthplace of leadership for our nation on the banks of the mighty Hudson River up in West Point. And there I got to, to serve in a, a very strange job really, it was like the Vice President of Student Affairs at a university, that was the final assignment. And there I, I got to, to get to know some famous artists, uh, Toby Keith, Dave Matthews Band, Jim Gaffigan, Jerry Seinfeld, because we were in charge of running a huge theater, second largest theater on the East Coast, and got to book some incredible artists. And one of the artists that uh, I got to know really well, and we've become friends, was Trace Atkins. And uh, I'm the, the father of three daughters. And Trace is, uh, one of them was married, and of course we had to play his great song, She Thinks We're Fishing, which is just a heartbreaker. But yesterday uh, we were talking with the groups and we were talking about uh, situational awareness, self-awareness, and then taking an action. The 10 years prior to serving at West Point, I served with some of the most elite teams on the planet, those that you buy tickets to to go watch movies about, you read books. They're the ones often that teenagers pretend to be when they play Call of Duty and Fortnite and Rainbow Six Siege. And part of the things that we covered yesterday was situational awareness, self-awareness, and then taking an action. And sometimes situational awareness in the world that I operated in for a decade, life and death is at stake. And in your world, sometimes, uh, situa a lack of situational awareness could result in a sale or not a sale, or uh, a client re-upping, or a referral. And sometimes, a lack of situational of awareness does not matter. I was reminded of this when Trace Atkins was performing at the Grand Old Opry in Nashville. And we had the Cadet Glee Club a great glee club that performed at the Academy of Country Music, performed alongside Trace Atkins, a song that's called Till the Last Shots Fired. It was the most watched, it was the highlight of the night of the Academy of Country Music Awards in Las Vegas. And so now we're at the same performance and I accompanied the glee club to Nashville to the Grand Old Opry and I was backstage with Trace and I was talking just, you know, he was telling me about the Grand Old Opry and he was saying, yeah, this isn't the real this isn't the original one, but there's this little piece of wood here that's very similar. Uh, they brought it over from the one that got flooded. Okay, that's, that's pretty neat. And then um, about that time, uh, a lady came out, and they see about 6,000 there, and she warmed up the crowd and, and she, it, as a mini pearl impersonator. And she did a great job. I mean, it was just like mini pearl. 
And I remarked to Trace backstage, I said, man, that, that is, she is so good. I said, she looks just like Minnie Pearl. And, and he said, yeah, she comes out here every night and just does a hell of a job. I've gotten to know her over the years. And so uh, about that time, one of the first musical performers started. It was a band. It was a band called Exile. And some of you may know some of their songs from, from the 80s. And um, this band started playing. And I, I looked over and I kind of shook my head. And, and Trace goes, you know, what's the matter? And I said, well, that band sounds just like Exile. And he goes, that is Exile. And I thought, you got to be kidding me. And they finished their song, and I got to meet Exile backstage, and that was, was really neat. And then about that time, I heard the next performer. I heard, uh, so many times I let my heart get broken. And I thought, wow. I shook my head, and Trace goes, what's the matter? And I said, well, that sounds just like John Connolly. And he says, that is John Connolly. And John Connolly came back. Stage and I'm talking with John Connolly. He's shorter than I am. He's like five seven. His son was in the Marine Corps, and and then about that time I saw kind of a flash and, and uh, a sequence was kind of shining off. And I looked and I started laughing and I said, "Gosh," I said, and he said, well, "What's what's the matter now?" And I said, well, "That guy looks just like little Jimmy Dickens," and he said, "That is little Jimmy Dickens. You realize you're at the Grand Old Opry, don't you?" <laughs> So sometimes the lack of situational awareness does not matter. Um, for the next six hours, we're going to break down the functions of the brain. <laughs> Matt invited me to uh, be the keynote speaker. He said, you're going to be the last speaker of the day. And I thought, wow, what an honor. He said, yeah, you go on right before happy hour. <laughs> I thought, okay, Matt, here we go. I want to point out two parts of the brain that are interesting and noteworthy that impact our lives. The first one is the prefrontal cortex. It sits up top, right out front. You see it there in the upper left. The prefrontal cortex is, is responsible for our emotions and our decision making. For women, it matures at about 24, sometimes 25 years old. But for gentlemen, well, we get a little extra time. <laughs> and for us, it doesn't mature till about 26 or 27 sometimes, which can explain why some of the most elite operators in the world, their average age is, can be 29 years old. Because what's at stake is not a Friday night football game uh, or a sales, it's life or death. It's the security of our nation. And in case you wondered, there's no one even close on the planet that is as good as our special operators. I got to watch them perform, trained alongside them, and got to provide direct support to them throughout many of their operations, and they are extraordinary. I am not a special operator. But I got to be very close to them. And one of my closest friends is a Green Beret uh, that uh, to this day is, is, is someone that I rely on heavily for, for friendship. The prefrontal cortex is important to know because especially with new hires, they may not have fully developed. It will serve as a hard drive for the rest of their lives. And whatever we rep, whatever we practice, even in the onboarding process, is going to really form that prefrontal cortex in the years in which they continue to serve, hopefully, here in Hub. The other part of the brain, which is interesting and noteworthy, is one that we really have to pay attention to, all of us in this room, and that's the amygdala. And that's down there, kind of, kind of towards, uh, just above the brain stem. Um, just think Amy D. Gala, the amygdala. And the amygdala is responsible for fight or flight. In real terms, it's responsible for us to lose control of our emotions, lose control, uh, strike out in anger, uh, lose control of, of where we are and what's important to us in the moment. And it's driven by what a term in behavioral science called stacking. And this was brought to my attention by a great leader who runs a company called Horizon Performance, Dr. Jat Thompson, who is not in the military, but he really studied this field. And he was explaining to me one time that the amygdala, the term is called uh, stacking. And the amygdala can start to stack over and over and over again. Let's pick a hypothetical. Let's say, for instance, our carbon monoxide alarms went off at 3 in the morning. <laughs> Immediately, uh, we would start to, to stack. And then let's say that to resolve that problem, we opened up a window and a cat jumped out the window. That's another stack. And then we stub our toe uh, as we're trying to get the cat as the cat squeals and goes out. Oh, there's another stack. And now we go 
and check and, and we turn on the fire to cook bacon and eggs and the, the gas doesn't go and now we wonder if we should have even lit that to begin with because the carbon monoxide alarm. And then, so we stack over and over and over again and then finally there's a straw that breaks the camel's back. Something happens, email, Wi-Fi goes down, some, uh, some family member says something to us in a tone that we don't appreciate and we strike out. We strike out in, in anger, we strike out with emotion in a way that we normally would not. The most elite leaders, the most elite organizations on the planet are acutely aware of when they are stacking because they know that they cannot afford to have their amygdala hijacked. They must, they must stay in control and be situationally aware and self-aware at all the time, at all times so they can make clear, objective, and correct decisions. This can occur in the workplace. I work with a lot of organizations across the country, across this great state, and we talk about how to disrupt the amygdala when it is hijacked. And the great method, the great technique to avoid being hijacked is to speak, to let someone know in your life who you trust, to who you love, because these are the ones that we often strike out against in anger and later regret it when we do stack our amygdala. Give them permission to speak truth into your life. What we know about the most elite teams, that they will tell their team members, hey, when you see me or watch me start to stack over situations that are really independently related, like the cat jumping out the window and the carbon monoxide, and when this happens, alert me. And then they take a deep breath, they become situationally aware, self-aware, before they, they key a mic and a radio and communicate something, they're very calm and collected. They never allow their amygdala to get hijacked. We are all vulnerable to this happening. Some of you may be reflecting right now on this morning or even the past week that a time when we may have struck out in anger against somebody that we love very much, that we care for and we need in our lives or perhaps we work with on our teams. And that comes from a lack of self-awareness, situational awareness, and then discipline to be aware of it and to think about actually what is occurring inside the brain. I do want to talk about how some of these most elite teams on the planet behave because it is wor worth noting that they, they operate under a unique set of behaviors. Yes, they are very talented. They have talent, they are on the team, and they're constantly developing one another. They are among the top 4% of organizations on the team. Now, there's a great book that James Collins wrote, Good to Great. Many of you have it on your shelves. Think of a pyramid with the largest part of the pyramid being the average. And then, of course, we have below average. Then above that, we have good and then great. And at the very top of that pyramid represents the 4%, the elite. Only 4% of humans and organizations are actually elite operators in their lives or in their causes. Their causes, which I'll get to here in a second. It's not their talent that separates them from others, from the average, defined by the majority. It's their behavior. I know KPIs are extraordinarily important. And they, they are a great way to measure outcomes. But if you listen to Simon and other folks that are in the field of human behavior, human science, they will talk to you that, about the behaviors required to impact those KPIs, to impact results. And oftentimes, we'll find that it's not the talent, it's the behaviors. I heard a lot to the, this morning about communications and, and so correct about you know, uh, over-communicating. I heard that a lot from the panel. We have to over-communicate. That is absolutely correct. I never get a call from a, a major corporation that says, you know, our biggest challenge here is we just communicate way too well. Uh, we just communicate so much and we're so collegial and communicative, it's become a problem. We need someone to come in here and shut down all communications. I never get that call. <laughs> they do speak from a unique, they speak a unique language that they've all agreed upon. And this term right here, they all agree upon, that we, we have complicated way too much. And we need servant leaders in our lives, in this great state, in our nation, now more than ever. And what we have to uh, agree on is a definition of, of this term leadership. It's filled with cliches, lead by example, do what's right when nobody's looking, or take it from the cadet prayer, allow me to choose the harder right 
over the easy or wrong, the cadet prayer up at West Point. But in its simplest form, and I've worked with some great PhDs at West Point and, and actually taught the officership course at West Point, um, was the last course that I taught. Uh, before that, I, I, I taught French, which is not very handy in Texas. <laughs> but I did teach it, and uh, you'll get a couple lessons in French here today on two specific words. But what is this term really all about? In its simplest form, leadership is nothing more than service to a cause. That's it. Leadership is service to a cause. If you're serving in a cause, you're leading. You don't have to be the most extroverted. This empowers introverts, the shyest of us, the youngest of us, the newest employee. If we're serving in a cause, we're leading. We may not be in a position of leadership. We may not be the, the senior vice president, the named leader. But we have the opportunity, not the guarantee, the opportunity to serve a cause. And they serve their causes very uniquely. And I'll outline how they do that throughout the next six hours. But we have to talk about their causes. Normally, each one of us has six causes in our life. Our faith, our family, our friends. And I saw that was mentioned here on the panel earlier this morning. Our faith, our family, our friends, our communities, our teams, insert sales teams, service teams, HR teams. And then the last one is the blind spot for most all of us, and that's ourselves. We have to lead ourselves. We have to serve ourselves every day in our thoughts, in our subconscious, in our conscious. Every day how we answer the bell in the morning is an opportunity to rep character, to serve ourselves so that we can have the opportunity to serve in those other five causes. Our faith, our family, our friends, our communities, our teams, and ourselves. If we're serving, we're leading. We do have to draw a distinction between these two because we're, we're born with a personality, but character is developed. That prefrontal cortex responds to when we rep, when we practice character. If we have sons and daughters, it's important that we instill little leadership laboratories, perhaps that they're not even aware of, that gets them to start thinking differently and changes their seeing skills. Their situational awareness, their self, their self awareness. When I when I talk about a, a family in their home, one of the causes I, I talk about point out to your sons and daughters little leadership laboratories around the house. The average teenager, for example, will open up a, a dishwasher full of clean dishes and pull out their favorite Yeti, slam it shut, and leave. But if we train them that hey, this is not about whether or not we enjoy emptying the dishwasher. This is a little leadership laboratory that will help develop your prefrontal cortex. And if you'll empty that dishwasher, it takes about five minutes. You'll find that that will lead to another action and another character rep. And pretty soon you won't just reach in the dryer full of clean clothes and grab your shirt and slam it shut. We've got to train ourselves situationally aware, self-aware, and then take an action that we have little leadership laboratories all around us. We just have to see them differently. I often anchor to a great book that I recommend it's by Dr. Carol Dweck. The book is named Mindset. And I work with academy leadership academies and various companies and leadership universities and other, believe it or not, with insurance companies. And we anchor to that book. It's a great book. It talks about a growth mindset versus a fixed mindset. And I love this book because it does talk about business. It does talk about sales. It talks about services. But it also talks about the other causes our families, ourselves, and it does draw from some athletes uh, through competition that we can learn from through their experiences. It's a great book called Mindset. I hope one day to get the opportunity to meet Carol Dweck. We're born with a personality, but character is absolutely developed. If I were to ask you about your pet that you have at home, you would tell, oh, well, that pet chose us. It came out of the litter, and we knew right away that that was our pet. Well, if you don't rep character with that pet, you're going to have a pet with a great personality that makes a mess all over the house. It's absolutely developed. And the blind spot for the average, which is defined by the majority, is often the lack of character and leader development. Insert service development. In fact, I heard, I heard one of the panel members today when he was talking about a great program that they've instilled in, in their company. 
Uh, it has to do with onboarding, and I forget actually the details. I think Chase was the one talking about it, and he actually said, we sh it's working so well, we should do more of it. We should do more of it. Well, here's the difference between the great and the elite. The elite, they, don't, they are not concerned with their intentions. They are only concerned with their actions. This morning, we either hit the snooze button or we did not. It's not that we had the intention of hitting it three or four times. We either hit the snooze button or we did not. That can often be the separator. If we know that we should be do some, doing something that works, that we know we can measure, that's impacting morale, that's impacting KPIs, we, instead of saying we should do more, do more of it. We know it's working. Our intentions don't matter. Only our actions do among the 4%. I love to come into a, an organization and kind of listen to the language that they use with, with one another. And average organizations will often speak in terms of I, me, or mine. We, we heard it a couple times this morning for, for some great, from some great members of Hub who've experienced some extraordinary success. In fact, I heard it probably four times. My team, my team, my team. The elite, they talk in terms of our team. We know who the colonel is. We know who the CEO is, the senior executive vice president, pick a title. But they speak in terms of our team. It's always our team, must. Our team will. When our team does this, this will have an impact. Our team received this evaluation. Our team will respond to that in this way. It's never a we. It's, I mean, it's never an I, me, or mine. It's always a we us and our. It's a subtle difference, but just pay attention in emails, in all communications, in videos. I'm so glad I sent that 30 second video now. <laughs> and listen for the I, me's, and my's. And then think, you'll even hear yourself doing it. I catch myself doing it several times during the week and I have to pause and say our. The military career that we had was not just me in the military, it was Miss Beth, my wife as well. And so I talk about our assignment to France, our assignment to North Africa, what that was like for our assignment up at West Point. It is, it is a indicator of someone that is situationally aware, self-aware, and takes an action. So think about that when we return back to our teams, how you might communicate what was learned here at this, at this great convention. I can tell you Hub is committed to maintaining an innovative, creative, flat organization that communicates like no other. This will take more time, certainly after more m as over and over again, but they are committed to keeping an organization flat that allows offices in El Paso and Argyle to innovate and create. Yes, there will be bumps along the way, typically with new technology, new platforms, but long-term, their goal is long-term to create a flat organization that innovates, creates, and has extraordinary elite success. The time we spent yesterday was a first of its kind, and I suspect that we'll do more of that because it seemed to impact all of the outlying offices that were nominated and came to yesterday's session. The third bullet on this slide is the one I'd like you to pay attention to because it, it is unique. The most elite use a process, a real process. They just don't say trust the process, which comes out of Tuscaloosa. They just don't say trust the process. They actually have a real process in place. And during the de decision-making process, there is an opportunity for everyone, the newest employee, to offer insight before the decision is made. But here's what's unique about it, and this is not a class on the de decision-making process. Once a decision is made by the decision-maker, when they rise from that table of round or that conference center or that conference room, they walk out of that room and they own that decision as if they made it themselves. They go back to the teams that they're charged with leading and say, here's what we are doing. Average teams don't behave that way. They go back to the break room and say, you're not going to believe the decision that came out of Fort Worth. How are we? This is not going to work. They have no idea. And the second, third order effects of that type of communication starts to sabotage the decision before it's even implemented. 
But the elite, the elite are so committed to the process of the decision making that once they rise and leave that room, they own that decision as if they made it themselves. Because they know that there will be another process down the road called the after action review process that will determine objectively, without emotion, whether or not the right decision was made or not. That after action review process is another six hour class that we'll have tomorrow morning starting at 7 a.m. That third bullet is worth your time. The communication piece that uh, they talked about today, they talked about over communicating. I can share with you a little story in 88 I had to fly back and forth over the Panama Canal daily. Uh, this was right before an operation where the guys came in from Fort Ord, California, and some Green Berets. And, and we were there for about a month prior to that operation. But I had to fly back and forth over the Panama Canal. And one time, the pilot who I got to know pretty well, he said, hey, would you like the controls? Would you like to fly the helicopter? I'm not a pilot. And I said, sure, that'd be fun. And I said, I don't know what to do here. He said, well, there's one thing you need to know. He said, I, um, when I give you the stick, I'm going to say, he said, it's not that difficult. You're just going to hold the stick and just kind of turn it to where you want to go. And we'll go that way. He said, but when I, when I say you have the controls and I give you the stick, you're going to say, I have the controls. And I'm going to say back, you have the controls. So there's no doubt who has the controls. I thought this was a little silly, but I played along. And he said, you have the controls. I said, I have the controls. He said, you have the controls. About six months later, my wife and I started losing car keys. And so we implemented this into our family. I would say, you have the keys. And she would say, I have the keys. And she would look at me and dare me to say it one more time. And I would kind of mumble it and say, you have the keys. I have the keys. Don't say it. Communication is often a blind spot for organizations, which makes it a great opportunity for those who really focus on it in the written form, in the video, as Coach Kyle mentioned. It's a great cross-check. That first bullet is an interesting one. After a decision is made, after a discussion is made, it's often great for the elite leader, whoever that one is in the room, I've seen it happen. They would say, okay, I'm gonna, we put out a lot of information here today. We put out a lot of roles and responsibilities for this project. I don't want to be dad and have to go around to police, but I may not have communicated. They don't assume that they were the best communicator in the room, quite the contrary. They will say, I want to make sure that I'm absolutely clear on what we discussed here today, that I communicated what the intent is, the commander's intent. And they go around the room and the commander, the leader gets to hear, gets to validate that yes, what he or she said was clearly communicated. It's a step that's often missed among the average. And it may be a step that you will notice in meetings in the future. Especially those that are emerging leaders, someday you will be in positions of leadership and you'll have the opportunity to learn from both the good and the bad. Only if you take great notes and are situationally aware of how a great meeting went and how an average meeting was. This is a little football analogy here. You can forget that this is Football, though, because it really applies to a named leader, in this case the head coach, who's Brian Kelly at Notre Dame, who now has a newfound southern accent down in Louisiana. There's no sound to this video, but I just want you to watch it for a few minutes. I worked with Notre Dame for several months when Brian was the head coach there. And I was watching this game live, and I rewound it, and I video videoed this with my phone. Kyle would be so proud. And I sent it to Brian Kelly and I said, Coach, if you want elite culture on your sidelines, which is what he had communicated in South Bend, Indiana, if you want elite culture and communication on your sidelines, this cannot happen. So this is the quarterback for Notre Dame, left-hander named Malik Zaire, who just obviously failed. Think of him as a sales rep who has failed. He comes off the field, and this is how he is greeted by his direct report, the head coach. It doesn't matter what's being said here, but look at his reaction. So what is the blind spot? Someone say, what is wrong with that? 
Well, here's what we know about the elite. They know one another like no other. They care for one another like no other. They don't coddle one another. Therefore, they can challenge one another like no other. No care and challenge. I was reminded of this again by Dr. Dr. Jad Thompson when we were working with the University of Texas. This cannot happen on the sidelines if you want elite culture. They had not repped, they had not practiced how they were going to communicate when there was a failure, when there was a letdown in RPIs. When we have a failure, here's what you can expect me, here's how you can expect me to behave, and here's how I expect you to behave. You have to actually rep that. You should do that. You should rep that, how, how we're going to behave when we have a setback. We also need to rep how we're going to behave when we're successful. When you're successful, here's how you can expect me to behave, and here's how I expect you to behave. Now as you watch this video, watch who's watching. And what you don't know is the next set of downs, Malik Zaire would break his leg. He's done for the season. He would later transfer. Think of an employee going to a competitor. He would transfer to another organization, University of Florida, But because this was being modeled, now the backup quarterback has to go in with this mindset, with this reference point, with this behavior modeled for him. Is he going to play freely? Is he going to play without hesitation? No. Is he going to sell with confidence? No. He's going to perform with doubt. He's going to perform with uncertainty and fear of reprimand. Just an interesting little insight from Notre Dame. Conversely, Coach K, who's the head coach at Duke, you're gonna hear him say a few things here today. He's gonna to say, we just need to be ourselves in this video. This is a March Madness game at halftime. And you're gonna hear Coach say, we need to grow up. We need to be ourselves. What does he mean by saying, we need to be ourselves? Well, here's what you don't know about Coach K, perhaps. He actually reps character. Well, Coach K went to West Point. He played for Coach Bobby Knight. Learned a great deal from that experience. And Coach K actually practices character. He reps it in practice and in games. In fact, he keeps a camera on the bench. And he breaks down behaviors after the game of the bench players. How they responded after success, uncertainty, failure. He breaks that down just like he breaks down a game film. So let's listen to what he says here when he's challenged at halftime by a reporter. Coach, what did your team at the half? Well, to grow up, you know, which uh, for three 18-year-olds, that's what we've been telling them the whole year, and they have. We played really young in the first half, and they played well against us. I'm not taking anything away from them, but uh, that was one of our worst halves of the year. And, we didn't have good expressions on our faces. We didn't have good talk. And we're five points down. And we, we just need to be ourselves. And if we're ourselves, then we'll have a chance to win. What adjustments do you make offensively to get this team in some sort of a rhythm or a yeah, flow? Yeah, it's all it, it, what I just said. It's yeah, I mean, it's not X's and O's. Most things are not X's and O's. Most things are, are mental and heart and mind and togetherness. And we need all those things. And then whatever we draw up offensively has a better chance of working. Thank you, Coach. Right, thanks. That's interesting when you, when you think about it. He's not worried about the, the tactics, the checklist. He's worried about the behavior. We didn't have good expressions on our faces. We didn't have good talk, communication. That's what he's most concerned about. He knows the sales. He knows the services. He knows the great hires will come. If we know one another like no other, if we care for one another like no other, not coddle, we'll be able to challenge one another like no other. Average organizations are just the opposite. That represents the majority. They challenge out of the gate. Why? Because I'm in a position of authority. I tell you what to do. You do it or else. It's tied to goals. I tell you what to do. I'm going to pretend to care for you by asking how your day is at the break room. And I'm going to act like I know you at the annual Christmas party. That's average. That's the majority. The fact that you're now made aware of that, insight to a remarkable world of elite behavior, you can now start to change that, perhaps, if it's not the way you want it. 
Know one another like no other. Care for one another, not coddle. Therefore, we can challenge one another like no other. The most elite teams on the planet are open, vulnerable, transparent. They build trust with one another. They are unafraid to fail in front of one another. They are innovative. They are creative. They're the first to laugh at themselves when things silly go on. The average, when the boss does something silly, stumbles on a stage coming up here or something, they never, they never want to laugh because they know the boss will look and threaten and perhaps take it out on an employee. The elite are so confident in who they are and who they brought into their teams that they're totally confident in their abilities even when they make a mistake. Most things are not X's and O's. One trait that I learned that was fascinating that was taught to me by a three-star general, Lawson Magruder, went to the University of Texas. He was my brigade commander when I was a young lieutenant. I knew nothing about the military going into the military. My only thought was playing in the Southwest Conference and naively thinking that maybe we could play professional baseball. I was just lucky to get in the lineup during a midweek game. I loved it when UTA came to town. I knew I was getting in. So I knew very little about the military. And it was this man that really helped develop me. He served like a mentor, like a father to me. And he said, you know, Craig, when things go wrong, if, if every person would start from their own position and work in concentric circles, they'll often find that a solution to their problem is a lot closer to them than they previously realized. They hadn't even considered that maybe they needed to communicate one more time or they weren't as empathetic. They didn't realize that this employee who's always on time, who always hits their goals, that their mother just had a stroke. They'll start with themselves and they'll ask, do I know this person? Have I cared for them, not coddled, before I go out and challenge them? I use a, an example that's close to home that many can relate to. In our home, I have a chair that's, well, it's designated as, excuse the pronoun, my chair. So I've got my chair here. And, and on my chair, uh, there's a place for now reading glasses and a place for Texas Parks and Wildlife, of course, and a place for the drink. And we have the remote control right here by the arm of the chair that's designated for dad. And if I reach for the clicker, is what we call it, and it's not there, I will say, girls, girls, Julia, who took the clicker? And Julia will say, Annie had it last. And then Annie will say, no, Kathleen took the batteries out. And now the whole team is up there arguing about who took the clicker. And if I would have done discipline from my own position, I would have realized that when I went into my chair that I bumped the arm of the chair, the clicker is laying right here between the arm and the pad of the chair. And then when I discover the clicker, I proudly announce, girls, never mind, I have solved this problem that I created. I have found the clicker. It's too late. They're now arguing about hairbrushes and clothes and throw pillows upstairs. <laughs> I have disrupted the team because I didn't do discipline from my position first. Elite leaders will always start with themselves and work in concentric circles. And they'll often discover that their keys are still in the door, their purse is hanging on the back of the door handle at the pantry, their sunglasses are on their head, their wallets and their other pair of shorts. Hard to do. But I promise you, within this week, within this week, Something like this is going to happen. A hotel room key, a car key, something's going to happen. You're going to say, who took mine? And then you're going to realize, if you would have started with yourself, you would have found a solution was a lot closer to you than you had, may have even considered. When things go wrong, they have a process that they default to. There is fear, no question about it. There certainly is fear any time there's an M&A. There's fear and wonder. Is this going to work? Are, they, are we aligned with them? Are they going to get us? Do they know our culture? Do they know our community of Argyle? Do they know El Paso? Do they know what we face? Fear is real. The elite don't ignore fear. The average do. The average say, oh, they'll figure it out. They'll figure it out eventually. That new employee who doesn't know where to go, they'll figure it out. 
The elite will go to that fear. They'll go to that newest employee. They'll go to that newest acquisition and get to know them, care for them, so they can challenge them down the road. But they never skip the first two steps. The elite will go to that fear, and they will be courageous. It's your first French lesson of the day. The root word of courage is French. It's cœur for heart. When we encourage someone, we give them our heart. When we discourage, we take away their heart. They have the courage, they have the heart to go to that newest employee, that newest acquisition, and get to know them, care for them, and then challenge them. I was reminded of this. I had the privilege of being the only American in France for one year, serving at the French Staff College. We lived in Paris, and the French, when they have an American isolated, they call us all Yankees, by the way. When they have the Yankee isolated, they try to challenge the American to see if she or if he will accept their little French challenges. Their obstacle course got to fly in a French Mirage 2000, which is the equivalent of a F-16. And then the French came and said to me, uh, uh, they called me JC, James Craig. They said, JC, uh, would you like to jump with our elite special uh, parachute team in southern France? And I said, you're darn right I would. I hate heights. They scare me to death. But when you're the only American and the French challenge you to jump with their, you say, oui. <laughs> and so they said, we know you're from Texas, we know you're from the, the hyper power of the United States, and your parachutes are enormous, giantish parachutes. Our chutes are much smaller, but they're better quality. I said, okay, well, let's go do it. So we went down to southern France, and the first two jumps went well. Um, yes, we had wine and cheese between jumps, anything to get rid of the jitters. The third jump didn't go too well. It was not because of the wine. I did not exit the aircraft properly, and I hit my shoulder on the side of the aircraft. And when that happens, it starts spinning you. And I'm sure there's someone in this room that's probably jumped out of an airplane and parachuted before. Fear can overwhelm this situation. But if we've trained and practiced for it, a sense of calmness comes over you because you've got plenty of time. In fact, you've got the rest of your life to solve this problem. <laughs> and because we had a process, a real process that we had practiced, that we had trained, that we had agreed upon, you immediately go to that process, and it's not complicated. It's fairly easy for anyone that's jumped out. You know it's not that big of a deal. But sure enough, I went to that process, that maneuver, after failing, because we had pre prepared how we were going to react if there was a failure, I immediately went with a sense of calm and solved the problem, and at 500 feet, the little French parachute opened up, and we landed with no problem. And that was the last time I jumped, and I hope I never do it again. But I love to deer hunt, so I don't mind getting up in a deer stand. I just don't like to jump out of airplanes. If you're going to take a picture of any slide, it's this one. Most average organizations, in fact all, which represents the majority, are instructive. Root word, instruct. I tell you what to do or else. If you don't hit this goal, there will be consequences. You will be punished. They are instructive. That is average. The most elite teams on the planet, even in business, they are constructive. Root word, construct. They know they have such belief that they brought the right people on board to the team that they speak in terms of when we make this phone call, when we do this event, when we rehearse, when we make this sale, we will be successful. In football, the, the analogy would be if you don't make that block, we're not going to score. You must make this block or the play's not going to work. Constructive would be when you make that block, this play's going to succeed. This play is going to result in a touchdown. One inspires. The language among the elite is so unique. It's worth your time to practice, even in your own self-talk, even in your own self-doubts. 
Whenever you feel yourself being instructive with yourself, flip it to a constructive idea, a constructive thought. When you're being instructive in a meeting, figure out a way to make it constructive. There are times when we must be instructive. Let's not be naive about that. We must be instructive at times. Typically up against the deadline or when safety is involved in construction, for example. But if we can get to 80% constructive and 20% instructive in everything we do, do and all of the causes that we have the opportunity to serve, we've got a chance, not a guarantee to be among the elite. We're certainly going to be above average. We'll be good, great, and have a chance to be among the top 4%. The goal is to get 80% constructive ideas, thoughts, communications, and only 20% instructive. That is hard to do, but it starts with each of us in this room, and it does not matter our intentions. We are either instructive or we are constructive. Implied tasks. I heard uh, Kyle talking about you know, his daughter having to ask her 11 times to make her bed. What the elite do um, with fully developed prefrontal cortexes is they execute specific tasks with extraordinary accuracy and timeliness. And they immediately start hunting the associated implied task. Specific task, implied task. As little boys and girls, we were asked to take the trash out. Sometimes we had to be asked three or four times to take the trash out. Eventually, with poor response, we would say, yes, mom, I took the trash out. And then there was that awkward pause. And the question came, did you put a sack back in the trash can? And the response was, you didn't ask me to do that. Well, that was implied. That was a specific task with an associated implied task. The elite will execute specific tasks with extraordinary precision, timeliness, accuracy, and immediately start hunting the associated implied task. That's hard to do, particularly if you have a new employee in their early 20s who has heard the term coined by many football coaches, do your job. They will only do their job. And they will stop. That is not elite behavior. Elite behavior does their job. In fact, it's implied, funny enough, to do your job. But they'll execute their specific tasks and immediately start hunting what are the associated implied tasks. Whether that's in marketing, sales, services, HR, there are associated implied tasks with most every specific task. And the elite will find them. And if they can't find them, they will ask a fellow team member to help them find them. What else can we do? We can certainly have our vision clouded, and I had mine clouded on one particular event at West Point. Uh, we get asked as senior officers to escort the cadets to various events, and Steve Forbes, Steve Forbes had asked uh, that we bring 50 cadets from West Point, 58 miles down to New York City, and get aboard his yacht, the Highlander. And if you have your phone out, you can look up the Highlander. It's a beautiful yacht. I hope someday to own a yacht, but I don't think it's going to happen. And we were going down to, to sail on the yacht uh, for three hours, and then we're going to watch a, a football game at Mikey Stadium there at West Point. And on, on board the yacht, we're going to be 100, 150 successful business people there in New York City. The vice president of Disney, the president of such and such bank, the CEO of Bull of the Watches, you get the idea. So we go up that morning with the cadets, they're all dressed in white over white, and we get to where the yacht is, and there's a receiving line to meet Steve Forbes and his wife. And as we're walking in, I tip look at Miss Beth and I said, I am going to ask him a question that no one's gonna ask him, it's gonna force a conversation later in this voyage. And so we go through the receiving line, and I say, Mr. Forbes, what are Thank you for hosting us here today. It's a privilege to be on board the Highlander. I would love to know what it was like to be on Saturday Night Live. Oh, and he lit up. He said, I'm going to come find you. Those big eyes and his glasses. I'm going to come tell you all about it. And sure enough, we get on board. Steve Forbes joins us and sits with us for 45 minutes and talks to us all about what it was like to be on Saturday Night Live. So, so much so to the point that it started to become a little like uncomfortable because all these other people wanted time with Steve Forbes. 
And I was so caught up in the story that I kept asking questions. And then what? And then what? Tell me more about this. I was probing more and more. And it was good. And finally, Miss Beth's like kicking me under the table. And I go, Mr. Forbes, you've been very generous with your time. But there's so many people on board your beautiful ship here today that would love to spend some time with you. He goes, oh, I know. He's very gracious. He still sends a Christmas card. And I thought, wow, that, that was cool. And he got up and went started to mingle with the other guests. But where were the cadets? The cadets that I was charged in leading, in serving. Well, I couldn't see them anywhere on board. I went to the first deck, no cadets. Second deck, no cadets. Third, no cadets. What, did they all jump off the Highlander? I get down to the fourth deck, and there was a beautiful ice sculpture of a swan. This thing was beautiful. It would have done really well in this room, right in the center of the room. And around that ice sculpture of the swan was about 500 pounds of the biggest, most beautiful, perfectly boiled shrimp you've ever seen in your life. And around that shrimp <laughs> were 50 cadets dressed in white over white. They had cocktail sauce all over their... You know, You've never seen human beings eat shrimp like these cadets did on this yacht. It was as if they only had a limited amount of time and they were going to eat as much shrimp as their human bodies would allow them to. They had shrimp tails hanging out of their ears. I mean, it was, it was cray cray. They were in a shrimp coma. I've never, you could not get to them. Finally, I had to just to say, hey, I had to become very instructive. But the problem was I, I got so caught up in, in, in this clever question to ask Steve Forbes because of ego, because of ego and this drive to get attention that I totally forgot the cause that I was asked to serve. And so many times we as named leaders can perhaps, perhaps get so caught up in our own top world that we forget our job is to serve, to serve the, 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 the lowest, the newest member of the cause. First, we are all vulnerable to getting caught up in our own egos, wants, and desires. And we forget often, the average certainly do, the call to service, to know, to care, and then challenge. The cadets loved it. Miss Beth was over there with lemon juice trying to get all the stains off the white. And finally, we dispersed them, and the cadets went over like 10 upstairs, 10 this way, 10 that way. We ended up having a great time. Here is the formula. It's not a big secret. No care challenge in that order. Average organizations are just the opposite. They are very instructive. They challenge, pretend to care, and act like they don't. They're not very authentic. Is your organization that you're charged with leading, that you're charged with serving, are they authentic? If, if they're not, start with yourself is what I would recommend. Start with yourself and be as authentic and consistent every day. When we were in Morocco, for three years we lived in the kingdom of Morocco in North Africa. You don't get television when you live in a place like Morocco. Instead, you get the Armed Forces Network. And the Armed Forces Network is one channel that pipes in reruns of shows like Gilligan's Island and I Dream a Genie and, no, not The Office. You didn't even get The Office. You got all these reruns, Lost in Space. There's a throwback for you. And in between, there are no commercials. There, there are no Starbucks commercials or any other commercials. Instead, there are messages piped in from the Pentagon. And the one message, I, sometimes they're really corny, but sometimes they're good. And this one, this one I've never forgot. It was two soldiers sitting in an establishment having a beverage. Translate that. Two soldiers at a bar having a beer. And one of them says, hey, our physical fitness test is coming up. This is an RPI for us. We, we, we have to pass this thing. We want to do well. And he says, we should start getting ready for the physical fitness test that we have next week. And the guy says, all right. And they cheers to it. They toast. And they say, I'll meet you at the track tomorrow. The next day, the next scene that shows these two soldiers running around the track. They run around the track. And they get all the way around. And they just fall onto the infield. They're just huffing and puffing and out of breath. And while they're, while they're laying there, Someone like Justin comes around, someone like Hawk comes around, just ch -ch 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 running around the track. And the one soldier looks up at him and says, man, look at that guy. How does he do it? And his buddy says, I don't know, but he's out here every day. The point is, authenticity must be relentless. 
It must do it every day in order for it to show up. It can't just show up sometimes. The most elite teams on the planet are authentic, relentless, and selfless. They're called to serve the cause, hub, one of your causes in the professional world. That drive to serve the cause is so powerful that they answer the bell every day. The average do not do that, which makes it a great opportunity for everyone in this room to continue to answer the bell every single day. Leadership can be very lonely, can be very lonely. Most of the time, the great development that occurs here often by yourself. You have to be very courageous, lead with your heart in order to serve consistently over and over again. Your amygdala cannot get hijacked. That sense of self-awareness, that situational awareness, that empathy for others is an attribute that the elite teams, the most elite in the world, are drawn to. They ask three questions, by the way. They ask three questions when they're considering a candidate. Many are involved in HR here. These are the three questions that the most elite teams on the planet ask. Assuming they get through the gates and they are qualified, that they have enough skill, that they have enough talent to be considered for this position on this team, then they sit around a table and they look at the file, they look at the videos of the interviews, they look at the personality test if they took a disc or whatever, and they ask these three questions. And these questions are pretty simple, but man, are they insightful. Can they do it? Do they have the talent, the skills, the knowledge? Can they do it? Will they do it? It's question number two. Do they have the discipline to do it? And the third question is, will others do it with them? Can they do it? Will they do it? Will others do it with them? Think about that. Now put it on yourself. Think of that to yourself. Can I do it? Do I have the skills or am I willing to learn the new skills in this uncertain world that we were all thrown into a couple years? Can I do it? Will I do it? Will I have the discipline to answer the bell every single day? And finally, are my behaviors such that others will want to do it with me? If you have a team that everyone thinks like that, we can do it. We will do it, and others will do it with us. Now you've got a chance to hit every RPI, every goal. You've got a chance to soar like you cannot imagine. But the average don't think like that. They just want to get through the day. They're very instructive. They have a list of things that they do. They only execute some specific tasks, often not on time, often a little bit late or right up against a deadline. But the elite... They execute that specific task and immediately start hunting the implied task because they want others to do it with them. They have such belief in the team. A blind spot for the average is often their body language. And on Zoom calls, on go to meetings or team, teams I think you all use here, your body language matters. In the sport that I played, nonverbal communication was really how we performed in the sport of baseball. Even on Zoom calls, your facial expressions, the little bit of subtlety, the little bit of 30 minute on a Zoom call, you're communicating non-verbally. And it does have an impact. Again, Coach K, he worked with this player who played at the University of Texas for one year before going to the NBA. But he was on the Olympic trials and they were having a big team meeting and Kevin was seated up front and he had his shoulders up and his head down and Coach was breaking down some film going over some plays, going over some perhaps timelines or schedules. And Kevin had his head down, his shoulders up, picture him in a Zoom meeting. At the end of the meeting, Coach K called him up and said, listen, Kevin, when we're together, this is the body language required of all of our team members. Our shoulders are back, our chin is up, our eyes are in direct contact of what we're covering up here. And Kevin said, oh, Coach, I'm an introvert. I'm just shy. And Coach said, great. You can go be introverted, you can go be shy when you're alone, but when you're with this team, these are the behaviors required for us to be successful. And you can control that in this meeting. The next day they had another meeting and they brought up a picture like this of Kevin with sweat pouring down from his brow and his jaw clenched. And he points to the back of another player on the team and he says, hey LeBron, when you see Kevin look like this, what does that communicate to you? He said, oh coach, when I see him look like that, I know we're gonna win. Coach K just looked down at Kevin Durant, and Kevin nodded. He was repping character in a very constructive way. 
when you sit up, when you communicate non-verbally on a Zoom call at a meeting, the second, third order effects of that that you may not even be aware of to a new employee, to a, a senior employee, to your boss, to your direct report, matter. It's a blind spot for the average. Yesterday I was talking to uh, one of the ladies um, after our afternoon session, who's here today, and she said uh, to me, I'm so glad we had dinner last night together. And she said, I'm so glad we had this session yesterday. I said, tell me why. She said, because it really exposed to me the heart of hub. The vision of this company, this flat organization that really is committed to innovation, creativity, that wants everyone to succeed where they are. But this, I didn't realize what, what a great heart that Hub has. And it's given me hope and inspiration to go back to our office and lead with my heart to be courageous. What a testament. What a testament to this last couple of days. How are we doing on time? I think we got. A, I think we have a few questions. If you're ready, okay. to Craig. Let's, let's take a let's take a couple of questions, questions and then I'll finish with one anecdote. Yeah, I'll put them on screen. Emily's gonna work her magic. Here we go. Oh, I can't read them. Okay. You good? Yeah. <laughs> All right. That first one. <laughs> uh, I have relationships with a lot of college football coaches and. In the SEC, where it just costs more, uh, quite a few in the Big 12 and in other programs. In fact, a coach texted me earlier today in a D2 program in Commerce, Texas. And whenever I hear a coach break down a play and then at the end say, makes sense? I just put my hand up to my forehead. No employee, no player in the history of football has raised their hand after a coach says, makes sense? and said, hey coach, uh, that doesn't make sense. Can you, that, that, that makes zero, in fact, that, yeah, that makes zero sense. I don't think anybody understood. No, no one does that. The average, you hear it all the time. They put out a bunch, bada, 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 because they have, they have a 30 minute you know, meeting that they scheduled that really could have been handled a little differently. They don't, they don't really set and prepare for a meeting. They go in, they put out this new idea, this new design, and they say, make sense? Doesn't make sense. A way to handle that, first of all, is not to use that if you're in this room. A way to handle that if, if you have a boss that says, does that make sense? You can diplomatically raise your hand and say, perhaps it would be a good exercise if we brief back to you what we have heard. That boss is, anytime I said that to a general, you know, sir, ma'am, is this still open for discussion? They said, absolutely, Craig, what do you have? A good exercise is to say, maybe be a good exercise if we back brief you on what we've heard here today. Then they'll realize that perhaps what they put out did not make sense. But whenever I hear a coach say that, and oftentimes I'll text them directly, Terry Joseph at the University of Texas is going to be a great coach one day, but he has a bad habit. All that is is a bad habit of saying, does that make sense? No player ever says that. The no care challenge piece on Zoom. Yeah, a whole new world, right? Change of mission. That's why I love the book Mindset because it kind of gets to the what we call a change of mission mindset in that elite world. Whenever there is a setback or a change or some sort of perhaps uh, an air a helicopter went down, one helicopter went down, two helicopters went down. If you saw the movie, you saw when one helicopter went down, what the reaction was. There was a change of mission. There was no blaming, complaining, or defending, like my friend Brian Kite says, there was no saying, that pilot was the worst, I can't believe we let Joe fly that helicopter, I knew he was going to do something. Immediately they started, change of mission mindset, we're all going back on the bird number one, yep, I'm going to blow up the classified info, and then we'll blow up the other part of the aircraft so we don't leave anything behind. Zoom forced us to, these virtual calls forced us into a change of mission mindset. We actually have to train. I was talking to a company earlier this week and they, they had the same question. You have to put something out. Hey, when we're on a Zoom call, 
We have to commit to knowing, caring, and challenging one another. Our behavior, our preparation before a Zoom call is just like it should be if we were all together in a conference room. Because the average, the average will default to average behaviors. Communicate the commander's intent, communicate the leader's intent on a Zoom call, and you'll see a different response than perhaps if you've had in the past. How can constructive-minded leaders begin to change the instructive executive team? That happens a lot in the big conventional military, where I served briefly for about four years, and you would hear very instructive, we tell you what to do, you do it or else. It wasn't until that we all started from the ground floor, started being constructive with one another and speaking to that boss in a constructive manner, oh, consistently, over and over again. And I can remember at times the, the commander would say something like, uh, yeah, that sounds all well and good, but I don't want to hear it. I want it done. And then we would come back with it with a constructive you know, response. Sir, when we get this done, here's the second, third order effects of that. Start from your own position, serve yourself, lead yourself, and you'll have the opportunity, not the guarantee, but the opportunity to lead the teams, the communities, your, in your faith, in your family, in your friends. Leadership is nothing more, nothing less than service to a call, cause. A sense of humor, I'll end with this, if I may, Matt. As a second lieutenant who knew nothing about the Army, I arrived in the 25th ID, still wondering if I would ever get to play baseball again, and one of the things that the lieutenants did is they came to me and they said, hey, one thing we need you to stay away from is the Pac-Man. He's the executive officer, and he hates every second lieutenant that ever existed. He thinks of the dumbest form of life in the Army. I said, okay, stay away from him. And one night, I rounded the corner, and I was face-to-face -face with Major Mattis. We called him the Pac-Man because he ate up lieutenants. I said, stay away from the Pac-Man, and I found myself face-to-face -face with the Pac-Man. The general... The three-star general had decided that everyone in this division was going to wear a little orange fluorescent sticker on their watch, similar to the candy that you would find at Cracker Barrel that we may remember as little boys and girls on a little sheet of paper. There were these little dots of candy. And you would put it on your watch, and it was this, called a safety dot. It was fluorescent, fluorescent orange. So you would look at your watch and say, oh, it's such and such time. And subconsciously, you would think, I need to be safe in everything that I do. I'd never heard of this before, never had seen one. So I rounded the corner and I'm face to face with the Pac-Man. And he's looking at me with disgust. And he's smoking a cigar and he's chewing on something. And he reaches in his pocket and he pulls out a handful of these dots, orange little dots. And I'm standing at attention, I'm looking at him. I look at him again, I reach in his hand and I grab a handful of these things and I pop them in my mouth. And I start chewing these things. The Pac-Man looked at me and said, uh, what the hell are you doing, Lieutenant? And I said, sir, I'm, I'm eating what you're eating. And he said, I'm smoking a cigar and chewing on a piece of licorice. He goes, those are stickers. They're supposed to go on your watch. And about that time, they started to come apart in my mouth. And one of them got hung on that little Johnny in the back of your throat. And I started coughing. And the Pac-Man just kind of went, huh, you're about to choke it perhaps die on a piece of equipment that was designed to save your life. <laughs> and then he doubled over and um, the stickers were all over my mouth and he went into my boss's office and said, you're not going to believe what your lieutenant just did. That word spread throughout the entire division and soldiers would come and dump their three-hole punch on my desk with a little note that said, sir, thinking of you, thought you'd like a little snack. <laughs> it became a big thing. The most elite teams on the planet, they're innovative, they're creative, they have a sense of humor, and they're the first to laugh at themselves. If you have the opportunity to laugh at yourselves in front of subordinates, do that. I'll see you on the high ground. Thank you, Craig. Let's give Craig a big round of applause.